I have the honor of introducing my good friend, Shelby Cuddy, who's the director of pediatric uh, and congenital cardiology at the Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Blaylock Taussik Thomas Heart Center. I want to be sure I get all of that uh, together. And he's also the chair of Cardiovascular Analytic Intelligence Initiative at Hopkins. He uh, is an expert in cardiovascular imaging with over 260 peer-reviewed publications, and he focuses on the evaluation of myocardial uh, function and treatment outcomes for CHD. Uh, and we thought it would be perfectly appropriate with this two-part uh, webinar focused on the origins and the development of the treatment of tetralogy starting at Johns Hopkins, where Shelby is the chief. And uh, Shelby, take it away, please. Thanks, Gil, for the introduction. Hello to everyone around the world. At the outset, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the Congenital Heart Academy leadership, Grace, Sasha, and Gil, for organizing this special webinar. In 1944, a profoundly cyanotic child, born with tetralogy of fellow, entered an operating room. And for the first time in history, emerged from that operating room alive and pink. The magnitude of this achievement might be hard to fully comprehend today. A surgeon, a cardiologist, and a lab technician had joined forces to produce the first successful palliation for cyanotic congenital heart disease. This operation was a triumph of courage, determination, physiologic insight, and scientific innovation over a seemingly insurmountable clinical problem. Certainly, it's a model for bench to bedside clinical investigation, fundamental for medical progress. But it's also a story of how barriers of discrimination are ultimately overcome within academic medicine. Although it took far too long, Vivian Thomas, pictured here with Helen Tausig and Steve Muller, president of Johns Hopkins, was finally recognized for his foundational contributions with a doctorate degree in 1976. Palliation is great when there are no better choices available. But the 1944 pioneers of congenital heart surgery would have wanted us to go much further. We recognize that a systemic to pulmonary artery shunt leaves the patient with at least some ongoing arterial desaturation and continued right ventricular pressure overload. It burdens the left heart by asking it to supply pulmonary arterial blood flow. Later adverse consequences seem inevitable for our shunted patients with tetralogy. To make further progress in the management of tetralogy, we needed many new ideas. We were going to need to understand cardiovascular pathophysiology much better. A better understanding of the genetic component of this condition was going to be helpful. We really needed advances in surgical technique and cardiopulmonary bypass to allow intracardiac procedures. More accurate and powerful diagnostic imaging technologies were required. We needed medical management strategies to limit the late effects of cardiovascular load stresses and ways to organize delivery of lifelong care to adult survivors. All this work is still ongoing and to push forward, it clearly takes a village. We need to work out a few things if we are going to improve the prospects for these patients. We must characterize the relationship between pulmonary regurgitation, ventricular size, and myocardial function. While it's feasible to replace the pulmonary valve, we still need to know the optimal timing for this and identify those patients who derive benefit from a new valve and distinguish them from those who do not. It would be wonderful to have sensitive and specific biomarkers which could alert us to the risk of adverse events, such as arrhythmia, declining ventricular function, changes in exercise capacity and quality of life, and of course, mortality. It's November 30, 2020, but some things never change. The same 1944 model of scientific investigation must remain vigorous in the present day in order to respond to ongoing challenges. Today's investigators will be hampered by small numbers of clinical research subjects with tetralogy. Furthermore, broad heterogeneity in patient anatomy, treatment approaches, and surgical era complicates the use of traditional research methods. Indeed, our current research continues to transform data into insights every day. 
we may, however, be approaching a point of diminishing return from this classic approach. We now begin to ask, how much will patient outcomes improve from the insights into disease processes we currently get from our clinical research? Shouldn't our goal really be to take all of this information and use it to implement appropriate changes in management from which improved outcomes will result? The next evolution will require, in my mind, a fundamentally new approach. Such an approach will involve three paradigm shifts. First, we will need to focus on predicting the lifelong clinical trajectory for patients instead of relying solely on short-term horizons. Second, we need to embrace the complexity of biological systems instead of attempting to deconstruct them and study the individual components in isolation. Complex systems don't necessarily behave like the sum of their parts. And as such, the focus should switch to whole system behavior. Finally, we may benefit from moving beyond the traditional approach of reducing clinical problems to simply a compilation of traditional risk factors. We should start tapping unreduced data sources using newer and more powerful analytic methods. To illustrate this concept, consider a life trajectory project we recently launched in our institution, led by Cedric Manu and I and the Cardiovascular Analytic Intelligence Initiative. We begin with multimodal clinical data input, including imaging, lab diagnostics, and genomics obtained through consortium hospitals. Next, patients consent to share and report outcomes, which are collected through mobile applications. After that, data is processed and integrated using artificial intelligence-based feature extraction algorithms. This allows for application of advanced analytics and machine learning for predictions and trajectory mapping for the patient. The predictive models that are produced can then be tested through clinical trials in associated hospitals. All of this may seem speculative from our perspective in late 2020, but here are some examples of deep learning and computational risk predictive modeling projects currently ongoing at our institution, led by my colleagues, Dr. Sashish Doshi, Natalia Trinova, and Cedric Manu. These teams are different from the teams of the past. We all are far more diverse, dispersed, digital, and dynamic. However, we still can form a great team. The foundation for it is to have a direction that energizes and engages people, a structure that includes members with a balance of skills, and all this in a supportive environment. So much has changed in our understanding and management of Tautology of Fellow, but science is still the name and collaboration is still the game. Scientific collaboration is even more vital today than it was 75 years ago. Only highly integrated and interactive research teams are going to be successful in developing and sustaining efforts. The critical pieces for success are trust, developing a shared vision and building the team, along with self-awareness and good communication among the team members. In this way, we can have the optimism that the achievements of the past are only small step towards a very bright future for our patients with Tautology Fellow. Thank you for your attention.